And while everybody's getting their oil again, I want to just share a huge thank you. I'm flattered to be here to be able to speak for everybody. And of course, I'm extremely grateful to be able to be in such like an inspirational space. So again, second thank you to Impact Guild. Um, thank you to Estate Coffee, Tech Systems. And most importantly, while we're talking about self-care, I want you guys to just think about while you are getting this peppermint oil and this cooling composition, right? I want you to think about something that, of course, you're grateful and you're thankful for. So does everybody have their peppermint oil? Yeah? OK. What I would like for everybody to do is just go ahead and warm it up in your hands. And we're going to do three deep breaths. So go ahead and bring it up and cup it around your mouth. Let's go ahead and take our first deep breath in. And exhale. And your second. And release. Let's do one last deep breath in. And exhale. And go ahead and admire the space. You know, you can roll your neck around. And I encourage for you to even take that peppermint oil. And you can kind of rub it from behind your ears down to your shoulders. And even just let the weight of your arms just kind of hang on your shoulders and kind of work it into, of course, where some of us tend to carry a little bit of tension in our upper bodies. I think that this is extremely important for all of us to reserve this little bit of time to kind of be selfish and to check in with ourselves on a day-to-day -day basis. I wasn't keeping track, but I think that was just a, a couple minutes, right? But hopefully everybody feels a little bit more refreshed and a little bit more balanced and ready to get started with their day. So don't ever feel, I mean, of course, um, as I do have my, my family here, it's easy for us to get very, very preoccupied wanting to take care of everybody else. So again, just take that little bit of time to be selfish, whether it's in the morning, the evening, on your way to work, whatever that might look like. So when asked to speak on you know, the, the subject of, of symmetry, uh, first of all, I was flattered, so like kind of ego got in the way first, where I was just like, oh, how cool, you know, they want me to come and talk about it. But the first thing that I started to think about, because Juliet asked me on the way out to the car, like, well, what do you want to talk about, was, was balance. Balance is kind of what symmetry meant to me. So although I do work with hair, and symmetry is extremely important whenever it comes to hair, it's a word that I will use probably daily in our salon, I wasn't thinking about it so much in a physical way. Because I think when you look up the definition, which I didn't, I'm not going to share like the definition of it, it is very physical, right? It's about like a mirror and an exactness and a sameness, or asymmetry, which is the exact opposite thereof. But what I was thinking about was more of a non-physical way of how symmetry plays a role within our lives. So I'm kind of curious about how it works with your lives and who the audience is. So how many of you guys? Any small business owners in the room? Cool. And how about people that work for a small business, where let's say you know pretty much everybody that you work with or know the owners of said business? Cool. And how about designers? Do we have any graphic designers and web designers? And, uh, artists of different sorts? Do we just have some artists, whether photographers, uh, painters, whatever that may be? Cool. Well, as we're talking about all of this, I think we all share something in mind. Is anybody in this room a dreamer? And has anybody ever had this idea that just lived in your head and like full time lived in your head every morning, every night, while you were at work, while you were doing anything, while you were being selfish and trying to not think about anything, this is what was on your mind. Has anybody, does that kind of apply with most? Yeah. Well, same for myself. And that's going to be where we're going to get started today is kind of talking about this symmetry of what something lives in your imagination and what it looks like whenever it comes into this like physical and real world. So be ready. <laughs> for such, 
You know, like I think that we have this clear idea that we have. And if let's say, right, if we were to all visualize it, let's say that I were to give you all the materials needed, right? Let's say you had all the financials. Let's say you had the business plan. And I said, we're all going to create a salon, right? And this salon is only going to cut and style hair. And it's only going to have one chair. And it's going to be in a trailer that's 100 square feet, right? Everybody in this room would have something different. If I had like the pleasure of like kind of looking in all of your, your brains, right? We would all have a very, very different perception of what that's going to look like. And everybody's, with it being different, is all based off of, of course, like your personal experience, based off of what you've been exposed to and kind of what you want to make the same as somebody else. Whenever I look at my salon, which we're going to go through and kind of look at what the experience looked like, there is nothing in that salon that's, that's original. Like, there is nothing. It's all something that I found from somebody else and I was inspired by, and I wanted to do the same as somebody else that did it successfully before me. But what made it mine and what made it original, right? What made it something unique was the fact that my little combination of all of these things was mine and a reflection of me, just as everybody else's would be a reflection of their of themselves, right? Of their experience, where they find their inspiration and what they want to do the same as somebody before them. So as we are gonna get ready to go on a little journey, um, we're gonna start first thing first with what this trailer looked like whenever I had first purchased this thing. Thank you. So, you know, I can't imagine what it was like in the 1960s when somebody was just like, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna put a whole house inside of a little trailer on wheels that's 100 square feet, right? So it was kind of inventive in its own right. But as you can see, um, it definitely took a pretty wild imagination to be able to look at this and to be able to imagine what it, what it would become and what was going to be the future of this little trailer. So whenever we first bought this trailer, um, this is what the, the guy looked like. And I would say that this is not actually my first trailer. The, the first trailer I bought, the idea wasn't, wasn't there because that's the next question. Like, when is your idea ready? Sometimes we have this great idea and it lives in our head and we can almost make it a reality to where we could see ourselves living in it. But when is it that you take that first step, right? Is the idea too young or am I too young? Um, is the idea too old or maybe I feel like I'm too old? When is it that you are going to be ready to take that first step? For me and my, my experience of whenever I decided we were going to buy this second trailer, because the first one, little hurdles got in my way, as in the city didn't like my trailer like I did. And they kept putting <laughs> stickers on it saying that they were going to tow it and that they were going to charge me a lot of money if I kept it in my yard, right? <laughs> Along with that, the door fell off within the first hour of owning the trailer, right? <laughs> and it, if you can envision it, we're driving through New Mexico, it's perfect, right? There's a train in the background, the trailer's there, and I get out to take a picture picture of it and I'm like something's not right you know the door is not there right now and so we had to go back you know hours to go find our door and it, yet again that trailer didn't work out right but what you're gonna find is that those same hurdles got in my way again minus the door other other things um, and we were able to kind of kind of work through it but you know with this you know, first thing first, I had to learn how to be an electrician. Like we're getting ready to pull this trailer back. It's late at night and we're driving all the way from Weatherford, Texas to Austin and the lights aren't working. You know, we didn't have the right plug for us to be able to do it. So I'm not, uh, well, I am, according to me, an electrician. And I had to figure that out throughout. So there is gonna be all these moments that you're gonna have of, of course, self-discovery whenever you are considering what it's gonna look like to get into your head and to get into this dream. I will also tell you that whenever this trailer first showed up at our house, um, I might not use word for word on exactly what Juliet had shared with me whenever she saw it. And I'll also tell you that she never went inside this trailer probably until about two months before we opened. But one of the things that she said was she told me, I don't know what you think you're doing, but you better do it right, right? <laughs> And that's hard, right? Whenever you're trusting somebody's imagination, you're trusting inside somebody's brain 
that they're going to be able to provide something that wasn't just for me, and it wasn't just for this speech. This is our life, you know? This is our career. This is our, yeah, this is what we do every single day and what we share now. Um, and of course, did I, like between every one of these pictures, did I have fear and did I have self-doubt? Absolutely. Like this is the back of the trailer. Um, and although the door didn't fall off, uh, the whole floor did. You know, I had to take out the entire floor of the trailer to replace it um, along with the insulation. And I am also gonna share with you all that I'm a pretty kind of private and introverted kind of, I don't think I've ever shown any of these pictures to anyone. It was kind of like going down this like weird look into my mind of like all these pictures that I had and I say all, oh, this is pretty much most of them that I had taken throughout the process. And as you can see, like, you know, all of this, this aluminum that's exposed, that was something that, although it seems like it was quite simple, you know, this was definitely one of those testaments, and it makes me think of a quote in which I read that somebody had shared, I think we've all heard it, that if you love what you do, you're never going to work a day in your life. And what he had shared was that if you love what you do, you're going to work every day of your life. And I don't know if that applies to anybody else in this room to where if you do love what you're doing, it's not so much about you just get to go and have fun. I, mean, I don't know what it, what it means otherwise, right? Where it's like you don't work a day in your life. No, it, it really does fulfill every waking moment of your day. And you're always going to be, of course, on guard while you're working through it and preparing for what that next step or that next hurdle is going to look like. I'm also a plumber too, just so you know, <laughs> not just an electrician. But whenever we say you have to work every day of your life, um, life didn't go on pause for my, my dream and my thought of turning this trailer into a salon. You know, life was still happening uh, full force. I mean, throughout this time, uh, you know, Juliet and I got married. Along with that, we started to plan our family, as in we, you know, have our daughter Arlo, who is coming into the picture at this time. Uh, I still had all of my demands at work. It's not like work gave me, like I could tell them, hey, you know what? I know I've worked really hard for seven years, but I'm kind of done. I don't really want to work as hard. I don't wanna have all these responsibilities, right? But I still had to retain that while I was going through. So throughout every day, it's I'd get home at night and I would paint on this paint stripper and then go to bed. And then before I'd go to work at eight in the morning, I'd wake up and I'd go scrub off some paint and then go to work and no one else was supposed to know about it, right? This is all like something that I was trying to work on throughout. So as I say that, again, it is gonna come down to the other part of it of, what are you willing to give up, you know? And what are you willing to really invest into it? So you guys ready to see what, this is our trailer now. And I know many of you, it's nice to see friendly faces that have been inside, but I'm gonna give you guys a peek inside of what our trailer looks like now. And although I had it, you know, drawn on plenty of scrap pieces of paper. This really was a quite organic experience while I was going through and building this. Um, it was really kind of taking it one step at a time and letting the design happen organically. There was also many times to where at the very end of the day, after I had spent hours in my hands were all chewed up from doing whatever I was trying to do or figure out. I would tell Julia, like, hey, I need to just go like sit inside. And sometimes it was just this empty trailer, but I just need to go like sit inside of it for a few minutes, right? Just to kind of collect my thoughts and figure out what we were going to do. And although there was plenty of, again, adrenaline that you gain, just like kind of like the adrenaline I had and, and having this opportunity to come and speak with you all, there's also those little setbacks that are going to that are going to get in your way as you're going through it. So it was really important just to celebrate the process and to kind of be proud of it with every little step that we went through. So as we were talking about when is your idea ready, first thing first, 
one of these days you're gonna get sick of hearing yourself talk about it. You know, like you talk about it with people and you share it with people. And if you have the confidence to do that, like if you have the confidence to share it with your peers, that's already the first step that again, you're gonna create an accountability, not just from yourself, but from your peers. I think what's more important is whenever you're willing to share it and you're willing to talk about it with unlike-minded people, with people that are different than you, people that might not be, let's say for us where we're offering a service, our target clientele. And I remember having to sit down and to sell this idea to somebody that was not ever going to entertain coming into our little trailer and getting a haircut with us. And they challenged me and they asked me questions and I had to be able to answer those questions. And that's whenever I knew, hey, not only am I ready to do this, because heck, I already bought the trailer. <laughs> it was like already <laughs> happening, right? But that's whenever I knew that it was gonna be successful. And I felt like no matter who was going to question what I was doing, that I was gonna be willing to stand up for my idea. Um, so I do encourage for anybody right now to please, you know, share, share exactly what it is that you want to see in your world and make those small measures to, of course, create it and to make that happen. So now we're kind of going to get into the, the second part outside of the idea of all of the, the design and thinking about the process of building this business. Well, now we have this business and it's gonna be figured out uh, the, the symmetry of, of work and life, right? So how many families do we have in the room? Do we have, how about just uh, somebody with a partner, you know, another person in their life that before you make any decision, you think about is it going to impact them and how is it going to impact them? How about families of three? Maybe the kiddo at home, okay. Four? Um, more than that? <laughs> applaud to you all, yeah. <laughs> applause to you guys. Um, you know, that's the, the thing to where I'm gonna tell you, I am by no means, I don't have an answer. You know, whenever it comes to work life, I think it's a lifelong goal that all of us are working on. I don't have the answer for you all. I really don't, but I could give you guys small steps and small measures that we take to just be mindful and to be considerate of it whenever it comes to every day of our life. So this is Juliet and myself, my wife and I, um, and Arlo is in utero, but in, there, in the picture too. Um, and this is before we were, you know, all the way like ready to open. And it was kind of getting into that pressure on like, well, when's the day gonna be and how are we gonna make this work? Um, and I want to tell you guys a little bit about Juliet and I before we do dive into and just kind of give you a briefing on like what a day in the life looks like for us now that we do have our business and it has been created. So we met 10 years ago in a salon and there is somewhat of a, of a beauty that we both knew the responsibilities that each of us had as in the amount of social and mental demand that our job requires. I know that people say all the time, oh, physically, like we're on our feet all the time, but that's not the half of it. You know, it's really about creating these relationships with people. You know, let's say you come and see us on a regular basis once a month and we work with you for an hour. You know, that's 12 hours, but if anybody has a hairdresser that they've seen for let's say a year or let's say more than a few times, you like share your life with that person, right? They know things that nobody else knows about you, right? I'm saying 12 hours in a year, like how much time you're gonna spend in your car this week or on your bike or whatever it is, you know, get commuting. You know, that amount of time you spend with a hairdresser, it's important, right? You know about them, they know about you. You talk about vacations and life goals and occupation and struggles and all of that, right? So those are like the demands that of course, are about our, you know, come about our life. But throughout our 20s, we were invested into our careers. So starting in Austin, um, Juliet worked at a salon for almost 10 years. She was there for nine years. And as I was saying, like, what are you willing to give up? She didn't just have, you know, her tenure with the business to where again, we were stable financially and we knew what to expect every day we went to work, but she had a complete clientele, people that were looking forward to that appointment, let's say every week, I mean, excuse me, every month, uh, every two months, however frequent it might be. And as for myself, I was spending most of my career at the Aveda Institute, so I worked uh, in the education and even into the management side of the Aveda School, 
And what had happened was we had both created like a stability and we had made ourselves kind of irreplaceable in a way. And that makes it really, really hard to leave a place whenever you think about the condition in which that place is gonna be whenever you leave it, whenever you have invested, let's say, seven or nine years. And so whenever we're talking about the amount of time we've invested there, we also felt like we reached this ceiling where we were kind of like, what's next for us? What other opportunities are we going to be able to gain from this? And it's almost like how many of us, if any of you all are homeowners are, how it feels like whenever you're renting a house and you're just like, you look back on it at the end of the year and you're just like, all that money just went into what? You know, it's not into a personal asset. And that's where we were. We were ready to create something of ourselves, but again, very influenced by all the experience that we had throughout our careers. I think what's most important whenever it comes to creating this work-life balance is considering the scale in which it's going to live on. So as I talked about us having financial stability, like we kind of had to just throw that out the window whenever we did this. It wasn't that we were able to retain the same pay that we were before, the benefits that we had, et cetera. We had to be willing to throw that out the window. And the other sacrifices we had to make is that we were, you know, collectively, we were probably working 90 hours a week. And our question was, as we knew we were getting ready to start our family, are we gonna be able to be the parents that we wanna be as well as the, carry the work responsibilities that we had? And we decided that what we really wanted was, we wanted time. Time was what was gonna be most important for us. So now we collectively work much less than that, not counting all the hours at home and et cetera, but it's like, whatever, 50 hours. So a day in our life roughly looks like, um, you know, it's kind of like this constant like rotation of parenting and working. So we both share the space. You know, I work there full time and Juliet works there part time. But if any of you have been there, whenever we've traded our shifts at the salon. Not only do you get to hear that, but you get to hear us talk about poop and talk about eating and talk about sleeping. That's what we talk about, here, here's the baby. This is when she pooped, this is when she ate, this is when she napped, let's do this, you know? And then we trade off and then she goes on and she takes Arlo or I take Arlo and then we kind of proceed moving forward. So for those of you, by the way, who haven't got to see this little, this little one. This is her life growing up in, in our little salon, you know? I don't know, I mean, she was very young, of course, there. Oh, let's not fast forward. So here she is again. Is that you? <laughs> Happy little girl. And I know it doesn't look like, like for us, it's just like, oh my gosh, look how much she's grown. She's huge. But again, this is just going to be a part of, you know, our life. Next time we'll have more, more images and we'll get to be able to share. Um, looking back on all of it, I am going to leave you guys with this. So uh, stress isn't an option, unfortunately. Like we don't have the option to live like a stress-free life. You can inhale all the blue oil or peppermint oil you want. You know what I mean? Like you could, you could have it on at all times. Um, you can have your own business and chase after the dream, but stress is not going to be an, an option. You know, we all have stress in our lives. It really just boils down to what stresses you can tolerate. And so I know this doesn't sound as fun or exciting, but it's kind of like you just get to trade out stress for stress, right? But I think being mindful of the fact that I'm willing to tolerate these stresses and I'm willing to take on what this stress is gonna provide for me is really what's gonna be most important, right? So as we do look at the current stresses we have in our life where we were kind of at that breaking point where we were thinking about how many more hours can we spend here? How much longer can I talk about this idea to my peers and to strangers? We decided to make that risk and to take on a new, whole new stress so we didn't know how to handle. Um, and I encourage for you guys to also go about doing the same. Um, so what I am gonna ask before we do take questions is, for me as I am now, 
uh, self-proclaimed. I, I have a license to do hair, just so you guys know, so don't worry about that. Like, the state <laughs> told me I'm able to do that legally. That's good. But there's a lot of, I feel like, self-proclamation that I had to give myself to do this. Like, I'm an electrician, I'm a plumber, I'm a carpenter, I am our financial advisor, I am all sorts of stuff that I didn't have anybody tell me I was able to do. So I want you guys to take a minute and think about it. And as I did actually look up the definition of what it means to be self-proclaimed, it is to be described to be such by oneself without endorsement by others, right? So what is it that you don't need to have this approval for somebody to provide for you? What is it that you want, right? That you're going to endorse yourself and proudly say, I'm a carpenter, electrician, plumber, and cosmetologist too, right? And husband, all sorts of stuff, right? But again, I want to leave you guys with that. Think about what it is that, again, you're not going to have to ask or going to have to get provided by somebody else, but what is it that you are going to self-proclaim yourself to be? Cool. Well, thank you guys. I do want to take some, uh, some questions as well. Thank you.